Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel, and uh, I'm going to be uh, introducing uh, Mr. Kunar and Chris Cherry. Uh, firstly, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm the founder of UOK Doc, and just wanted to say a big thank you uh, to our sponsors, Draeger, C3 Post Trade, and 507 Capital. Uh, and I'm very honored to be able to introduce you my supervisor whilst at Royal Patworth um, Hospital, Mr. Aman Kunar. Um, for those of you who do not know Mr. Kunar, he's a leading thoracic surgeon at Royal Patworth Hospital here in Cambridge. Uh, he qualified in medicine from uh, Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital uh, with an intercalated degree in psychology from UCL and elective experience at Harvard, the Caribbean, and in India. Uh, his experiences include dealing with the London bombings, and now he works at the thoracic surgical department, known to have the best results in the country. He's also a trustee and director of student engagement for the National, um, uh, for the National Professional Society of uh, SCTS and has a great interest in education and uh, developing personal resilience. Uh, some of his surgeries to be featured in the forthcoming C um, uh, BBC production, Surgeons of the Edge of Life. So without further ado, I will hand over to Chris and Mr. Kunal. Uh, welcome, Aman. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you're the sixth speaker that we've had. We've had such an eclectic range of speakers, and it's, it's a real pleasure and uh, delight to have you as the last speaker particularly as you've, you've literally uh, lived the experience of being a doctor and uh, a surgeon specialist. One of the things which would be really good to just set the tone of the evening is just to listen a little bit about the journey that you've been on, that you've taken to get to the position that you now are in. Um, hi, uh, thank you, Chris. Thanks, uh, Dan. Um, so, uh, it's it's great to be here and of course I'm really uh, uh, happy to discuss some of these uh, things. Um, a few seconds ago I actually covered my uh, mouth and I was muted then and I actually had to shout out to the family, shut up again and um, uh, please shut the door. So I'm saying that because if that happens during the discussion I'll have to do that but it's also relevant to my life and my journey uh because um that's a huge part of it and it also i'm sure uh has a, a lot of resonance with the with with re resilience and with coping with all the things that we do so uh about my journey uh i uh, was born in north india and my parents who are both in the healthcare professions uh, came to england um a bit for career, but also I think that the 60s in London was a great place, it was an exciting place to be in a couple of young people from a different part of the world who admired Britain, wanted to come here, and their story extended and they had very successful careers. Um, I uh, grew up in North London and East Anglia, where I still live, and uh, went to medical school straight out of school uh, cutting a very uh, long story short, I, I went to medical school be, uh, because it was easy for me to go to medical school, to be honest. Uh, I sort of almost walked in there. Um, I had an interview in, the, in a pub uh, at uh, uh, London Bridge Station with the admissions dean and went to medical school. And in medical school, I, uh, I grew up a lot. Uh, there was a time halfway through, just after my intercalated degree, where I really wasn't content with medicine as a career. Uh, and I went to the admissions dean and said, I, I want to leave. And he said, no, no, you don't want to leave. We'll, we'll give you a year off. And I said, please don't give me a year off. Uh, I might come back if you give me a year off. And I came back. Uh, but I had a great year. And the, the point I'm, uh, I, I'm making and I learned from that is that it's 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 got to be right for you. And whether it's medicine or something else, you, you've got to, if you're going to do well, and by that I mean something that will personally satisfy you, you have to, it has to come from within. The drive has to be there. So I went back to medical school and um, uh, that was all going fine. And then in my final year, when I was on elective uh, in the Caribbean, I, I fell down a small mountain and um, there's resonance in that story. Maybe that'll come up later on. And I injured my back and I sort of got through my finals and uh, uh, did my house jobs uh, at 
Guy's Hospital and our associated uh, Lewisham Hospital. And just after that, my back got very bad and I had to have urgent surgery, at which point I thought my career was over and I wouldn't be able to be a surgeon. And I decided, well, I'll pursue something else. Uh, and I started training in internal medicine, passed my exams very quickly uh, and went into research. And I, I went into research at that point because I was just passionate about training myself in basic science. And uh, again, the point there was that I was doing that because it, there was a theme to it, there was a story to it, but actually I just really felt the need to do that, to be good at science. Um, and during that period, my back got better and I realized that even though I had these other qualifications, I could go back at, and restart my training in order to go forward. So I uh, then set off uh, down the surgical route and uh, quickly got my exams, um, was lucky enough to get into cardiothoracic surgery training in London and uh, the, headed off to Toronto after five years uh, where I had an amazing time. Um, I didn't have to go, but again, it was one of those things that I felt I needed to do. Um, I think it was very tough on my family who showed a lot of resilience. We, at that time, uh, my wife had been recently appointed a consultant in London and we actually had at that stage five children and uh, very young children. And uh, uh, she let me go. Uh, and I went off there for six months and then she joined me. Uh, and we spent another year there, which was very, very fulfilling. And during that time, I was appointed at Royal Papworth, at Papworth as it was then, and came back to the old Papworth Hospital and started my consultant career there. So that is a story of uh, quite a long journey, uh, but always uh, progressing. Uh, and people, I think, at times thought I was crazy. Uh, why is this guy going and getting qualifications and this, that, and the other? But it, it fitted. So that's the story up to there, Chris. Just, uh, just one thing. I thought it was a lovely way in which you started your, your sort of uh, telling us uh, about your journey was about your family. I didn't. Were you aware that? I mean, you literally did one of the things that's been spoken about throughout the course, which is about being able to name something, take control, and take charge of it, rather than be a, in sort of an anxious anticipation of it. I mean, in terms of your family, you sort of took control of the situation. So if it does happen again, um, you're, you're sort of in charge of it. Did, did, were you aware of doing that? Um. <laughs> Not really, uh, but I think it must be one of those things that we do to, uh, to cope and to manage. Well, in terms of your leadership, in terms of you'll be running a team, is, is that one of the sort of things that you would bring into how you manage, how you take care of, how you keep in charge of the situation? Um, you're, sort of, you're sort of naming something that could go wrong. Uh, I, I guess so. I think that you. I think that you must have seen that by looking at it from outside. Uh, uh, yes, I, I guess so. But, um, but but it's something that I, I I don't think I can immediately elaborate on. I'll probably have to reflect on it for a while. Come back to it. Yes. Yeah. So so when you took a year out, hmm. what, what what was the because part well, another thing that we've been talking about is how young people are thrown into such challenging, um, stressful, and literally traumatic lived experiences um, as young doctors, as, as students. How, how did you sort of, was that part of why you wanted to take a year out? Actually, I think the reason I wanted to take a year out was because uh, it, it, was, it was simpler than that, to be honest. Um, it, 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 I hadn't seen enough of the world. I hadn't tasted enough. Yeah. Uh, I hadn't tried other things. I went from a very supportive family who uh, understood medicine. My, my grandfather was a doctor uh, in, in the British Army. He'd been out there in Singapore. Uh, I went to medical school. And, the, and because of the sort of schooling I'd had, I went to a great school. I, because of the schooling I had, it was, it was, it was a walk-in. I, I would have had to do something ridiculous not to go there and 
I, 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 at that point, there was just a lot of dissonance, a lot of restlessness, that the, the energy that young people have. Mm-hmm. And I think that if I had not pursued that and not been able to pursue that, mm-hmm. I would have, uh, I think I'd have become quite angry, quite resentful. And uh, it, it wouldn't have given me the energy that I think is so beneficial in a medical and indeed any other career if you want to get fulfillment from it. And, and, and so that you literally expanded your experiences, you sort of lived, lived experiences. Yeah, yeah, then, yeah. It then enabled you just to, to return to it. I mean, you were fairly convinced that you weren't going to come back. I was completely convinced. I was totally convinced. I'd applied for other degrees. I'd got a deferred place. Uh, there was no way on earth I was going to go back. But the, the wisdom of the, uh, of the then uh, uh, sub-dean in the medical school, who happened to be a surgeon, I remember him very well, uh, was such that he'd seen people in my situation before. Um, yeah. It was, it was interesting that it happened really just at the start of the clinical training. So I hadn't really had much clinical exposure at that time. I, when I came back in a much better frame of mind with much better attitude, I really enjoyed the clinical training and I got so much from it. And looking back on it, I, I, I thought to myself, how could I ever not wanted to have done this career? I mean, would, you, would, it, would it be something that you would advise students or do you think it's it, it's just specific to certain characters, certain individuals? Well, I think there's a, I think a lot of young people have very similar characteristics. They have a lot of energy. They're very yeah. bright. They they can do almost anything, but they, they they have to need to do it. So I would say to uh, those brilliant young people uh, yes. who are earlier on in their careers, I would say make sure it's for you. Uh, and, and part of that is trying it out, but there's only so much you can do. But part of it is trying other things. And I think that medicine uh, is one of those things whereby if you've done other things, it, it, it helps you so much. It really does. And what are some of the other ways in which you, how did you put it? It's sort of just knowing in your heart that, that this is right for you. And in, in what other ways would, would you sort of, um, suggest young young students to to sort of know that it's right for them. Well, so I know it's right for me because I have a incredible sense of fulfilment in doing what I'm doing. I I love actually being able to talk to my patients. Now, as a surgeon, we do so much operating. Yes. And we do research, we do audit, we do administration. And actually that precious time you have with your patients and actually can talk to them as people and get to know them a little bit is, is amazing. So I feel that's great. The other thing in particular for me as a surgeon, and I think this happens to people who are doing uh, procedural things, is that you actually lose yourself within a procedure. Uh, you, 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 you are completely in the zone. You, you, you perform in a, in a different way. The operation is, you're in control of the operation, but you're also in a different place. And uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it's knowing that that, uh, that is really important. How do you find that early on? Uh, immerse yourself in it, really. Immerse yourself in the procedure, in the, in the process. Immer, immerse, immerse yourself in what you're doing because there, there's, there's so much in medicine yes. that, uh, that, that makes it fulfilling. I think when people sometimes are struggling, it's because they have not been able to embrace it or they, ha- they are in a situation whereby they have lost energy. Uh, and the keeping and maintaining energy is terribly important as well. So energy, you mean sort of stamina, but physical, mental, emotional? Uh, in a, at one level, yes. Uh, and so there is a sort of building of stamina that comes about through 
uh, experience through being up late at night. There's a building of stamina. But what I really mean is about having passion. And uh, where does that passion come from? It, 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 we all sometimes experience feeling more alive than at other times. We've got more energy. There's a bounce in our step. We're more animated. It, it's about how do you keep that? And uh, everybody will be different. Um, some people need to go to sleep early. Some people need to go to sleep late. Um, I think that uh, taking time for exercise, taking time to enjoy nature, taking time to enjoy the, the company of friends. And that is something that often for doctors goes, uh, that, that, that um, it, medicine has an impact on people's relationships greatly, but what often replaces it is your team. And uh, working in medicine is, in, well, training in medicine is characterized by working in teams with very intense relationships and you think when you're doing it you will never be without these people and then six months four months three months later you go on to a different rotation and you yes. might keep in touch with one or two of them yes. uh, of course it's different now there'll be facebook you'll you'll see what's going on in their lives but all of those things help to maintain energy and balance and have you seen over the years a, a change in the culture of the, that team dynamic? The, the importance of uh, attention to mental, emotional uh, health? Uh, well, uh, yeah. So l let me break that down a little bit. When uh, I was at medical school, the, 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 f the firm was hugely important. And the, the best firms, the ones which people really wanted to be part of, were the ones where you had two or three consultants who seemed to get on, uh, a, a team of nurses who they'd worked with for a long period of time, and junior doctors would love going through that. And once or twice a year, there would be a function hosted by the consultants, which was really more like a family gathering than a professional meeting. And that firm culture is something which unfortunately and completely unintentionally was lost for a period of time uh, through the process of training which restructured teams which changed the the continuity of care uh, and on balance I think that was very important because I think people were working far too long uh, I have I did too many 120 hour weeks which which were fine at the time I had a lot of energy but you know, I didn't see my friends for six months. Um, so I think that's now coming back. And there's a greater realization of the team. And certainly in my hospital, Royal Papworth Hospital, I think that team working has reached a new level with the, with the response to the COVID crisis in a very positive way. Um, I, I think that the, uh, the, the way that people have been reorganized, moved to different roles, acquired new skills, worked in new teams, has been eye-opening and revolutionary in a very positive sense. I mean, could you say a bit more in, in, in the detail of it? Yeah. Um, so it, it, with respect to the detail, I, I think that our hospital, and I'm sure that many other hospitals did this, is they realized yes. and doctors realized that, you know, at an individual level, we realized even before people told us that back in February and March, when we were facing this and we were hearing about hospitals being overwhelmed, particularly in China and Italy at that point, where we were hearing about doctors and nurses getting sick and dying. And that was very frightening. And we had no idea what was going to happen. I, I uh, experienced SARS uh, professionally, and uh, we have been at Royal Papworth, we've been working with H1N1 swine flu uh, ever since it reared its head. and. Um, there was this scenario where we could have been overwhelmed and at that point what can you do and uh you cannot do anything more other than than lead believing 
And even if you don't believe, it's very important that others believe and you, you, you inspire people to believe that there is an end in sight and it will get better. So, um, and, and how do you do that? You, you do that by having a very positive culture. When people are going to be asked to sacrifice in many ways, possibly even with their life. And uh, we, we know that our country has had a very high rate of loss of health care and key workers. Yes. So I don't, and I don't think we should distinguish really between health care and key workers. The, the, the cleaners are, are just as important, if not more important, than the doctors and nurses, uh, as are all these other professions. Um, but how, what can you do in that time but have a supportive team culture and, mm -hmm. and lead by praise and encouragement? Uh, and, and I do think that our hospital, uh, and, and I have to say, I have to be completely honest with this, I think this, this came from the top, uh, were, ex were, were vocal and exemplary in, uh, in encouraging that. Um, I said that we started doing this even before those messages came out. I, I felt it was very important to be very positive at that point. And for me, a good day was getting my operations done, having all the equipment, uh, having PPE. That was a good day for me. And mm -hmm. I, I just kept saying, this is a good day. This is a good day. Because um, uh, I, I, I recall a, a book, uh, uh, a, a Day in the Life of um, Ivan Denisovich by Solzhenitsyn. And in that, there's this awful experience of this person in the gulag, a political prisoner. And if he's lucky, he gets half a bowl of cabbage soup or there's a, he gets a little bit of a, a scarf to wear. And actually, these small crumbs of comfort were what made him have a good day. And that got through it. So um, I think the, the teamwork aspect was really very important. I mean, I think that's a very positive, um, important way of it, uh, approaching the sort of days you're describing. When, when it wasn't a good day, would you also sort of acknowledge that as in, in, in the sense of n not being defeated by it or resigned, but just normalizing the, the, the this is not a good day? Um, well, I think, the, uh, I think it's important to recognize when things don't go well. Uh, I think it's important to talk about those things. It's important to uh, acknowledge that so that one can move forward. I think it's important. I mean, one of the things I'm just remembering, because you were quite heavily involved in the London bombing. Yes. Um, and there's quite, a, I mean, it's, 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 it's got its... Just to just share some of the stories around that, because it's, it's, it's applicable both in the context of what's happening now in its own way, but just in its own right. It's quite an extraordinary story. And yeah. we, we, can, we can let the dogs bark. Yeah, I'm sorry about the dogs. Uh, can you just give me a second? Sure. Sorry about that. Um, I, I said at that stage we had five kids. We actually have six kids now and two dogs. So there's, there's quite a lot of background noise. Apologies That's for that. A lot of background. Um, um, uh, yes, so the London bombings. Well, uh, I, I think the, 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 the July 2005 London bombings are something that will uh, live with me forever. Um, as a child, I grew up uh, in London and we had the IRA. As, uh, uh, and as, as when I was at medical school, there was some of that going on. And we also had uh, some trouble with... Um, uh, other terrorist attacks. The, uh, but as a uh, still uh, as a uh, as a junior doctor back in two thousand and five, um, I was working at St Thomas's Hospital, uh, and I was one of the senior trainees in cardiothoracic surgery. And the uh, we heard uh, on in the morning that there was a problem on the tubes with uh, a power outage and. Almost immediately, you always think there's something else going on. And very quickly, I could see the hospital beginning to mobilize. Uh, 
Um, then we heard that uh, there'd been a bomb uh, in Euston, uh, in the Euston area. As it happened, it was outside BMA House, British Medical Association House. And mm. the first thing that went through my mind was that, okay, UCH is going to be overwhelmed and we'll be next to receive casualties. Uh, and that started to happen. Um, I remember in particular two of our senior consultants showed fantastic leadership. Um, and uh, organized people. So once again, we were redeployed, not in our, in our usual clinical teams, but five doctors there, five doctors there, some nurses there, clear the, the, the way to the operating theater. And uh, then the casualties started to come in and I had been uh, put in uh, A&E with uh, a senior orthopedic trainee. And our job was to um, our job was to make sure the, the people and bodies coming in were either dead or alive because they'd been triaged on their way in. And uh, there was a body that came in. Uh, I have to be very careful not to give you any identifying characteristics. Uh, and they were triaged as dead. Now, I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon. And at that point, uh, what we did was we brought people back. That was part of, of of how we work. And I thought this patient was young and cold, and were they really dead? And I examined them, and I thought, I think there's something there. And we did emergency resuscitative surgery in the accident and emergency hospital, which was actually making holes in both sides of their chest to let out any air or blood that had accumulated in case that was stopping and affecting their circulation. And we got a very thready pulse. So we gave them lots of volume and uh, a tourniquet on a very severely damaged limb. And off they went to operating theater. And uh, that patient survived and left hospital. And that was very meaningful for me. And so the day, uh, not uh, over a period of time, left hospital, but th that day was characterized by those sorts of events. And we worked really hard that day. And I know we, uh, the people at St. Thomas's, we did very well. And then uh, uh, it, it was in the afternoon uh, or early evening, the tubes weren't running, the buses weren't running. And at that point I was living in Dulwich and I had to go home. Uh, we were stood down. And myself and another guy who was uh, a physician, um, I'm not sure, he might have been a consultant at that stage. He may have been still a registrar. We'd, we'd actually been trainees at one stage together. Um, he and I uh, uh, said, okay, let's walk home. So he lived in, around the corner from me. So we set off, we were starting walking and we were talking and reflecting on the day thinking about the good moments, the bad moments. And we walked uh, the five miles to Dulwich. And uh, I was thinking to myself, you know, we've done something good today. You know, we've coped, uh, we did well. And as I came uh, close to Dulwich railway station, uh, and it was a very beautiful day and it's a nice part of town, trees, birds, sunshine. Uh, I was walking along and I had a little kit bag on my shoulder uh, walking with my colleague and there was a policeman standing outside the station and I, I, re I saw he had a weapon with him, an uh, automatic rifle and I, yeah, that's fine, you know, we're on high alert and then I saw him take the gun and point it at me and I realized that I'd gone from being a uh, valued member of the team uh, at St. Thomas's Hospital to being profiled as a possible attacker or terrorist. Now, I don't know if he'd have pulled the, the trigger, but I was saved because my two-year-old, uh, at the time, blonde daughter, uh, my oldest daughter, ran towards me because my wife happened to be walking in, in, in the area and they knew I was coming back. And as this little girl ran towards me and I focused my attention on her, I, uh, I could see him relax um, and okay, things were gonna be okay. And so um, that is part of my memory of the day. 
how, how do you prepare, in what ways did you process that in, uh, over the coming days, weeks? I mean, both, I mean, both professional and personal trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the fact that I'm still talking about it means yeah. that maybe I haven't come to the, the end of the road of that processing. Um, I think that the, uh, with respect to the professional aspects, um, that's what I was trained to do. Uh, I was, uh, I had a little bit of, uh, military training a little bit. Uh, I, uh, had been a doctor for a number of years. I'd, I didn't, I'd, I'd worked in the accident and emergency department. I was trained to go towards the problem and deal with the problem. Um, and when a hospital with good leadership turns its focus, its collective focus on a problem, we can do very well if we're not overwhelmed. So I think professionally it, it was good. Um, on a personal level, um, it's one of those instances when you realize that you're not part of the majority. Uh, and I'm somebody who is hugely privileged. I've had so much opportunities given to me. Uh, and uh, I, in many respects, you know, people will look at me and they'll see me as part of the establishment, um, which of course I am. Uh, but there are moments in my life, and I'm sure there are moments in everybody's life, when you realize that actually things might not be that safe or that good, and you have to be able to adapt to it. Um, so that's where I am on the, profession, on the personal side with that. <clears throat> I mean, one of, one of the things that, that's being talked about, I'm sure you're, you're aware of, is this idea of post-traumatic stress mm. as a result of the front line work the the, the 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 emotional challenges and the witness scene and being involved in quite distressing scenes what, what, what's your thoughts about do you feel there's an impending wave of pdsd going to emerge from uh, clinical staff um i i think that uh i think that people will experience a lot uh uh, and uh, I think that it will, some of those people will actually uh, suffer a, a disorder from it that, uh, that affects their lives. Um, I think that uh, we, we do internalize the problems that occur. Mm. We don't always recognize that. We and I think that can come out in various problems and, and people have different coping strategies, some of which are, will be healthy and lead them to uh, maintain, increase energy and be well. And some of them will be unhealthy uh, and they can be manifest sort of overtly with alcohol or with other self-damaging behaviors. I, I think that will occur. Um, in my own experience, I think that it's, it, it, there's, a, there's an importance to be able to talk about and to recognize those, well, recognize and talk about those feelings. And I, I think that, I, I actually think that a lot of people uh, find it quite difficult to talk about those feelings. Um, and part of it is intrinsic and part of it is, is the training. Yes. Uh, and... Uh, I think that it is better to be able to confront those issues and to be able to talk about them and to share them, to know that you're not alone. So I, 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 in other respects, I, I remember patients that have died. I remember particularly uh, painful situations. For me, the, some of the hardest situations have been um, when children have died. Uh, I, as a trainee, I, I found that very difficult. And it's actually one of the reasons that I steered away from pediatrics. Uh, it, it, I think you've got to be really tough to be able to look after children. I have great admiration for people who can do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, could you sort of, you experienced the, the, the London bombings. Was, do you think things have changed in the anticipation or awareness of uh, in some ways, the trauma will reveal itself in clinical staff. Do you think things have changed in the attention and understanding? 
I, I, I do. I, I think so. Uh, I think there's always more that we can do. I, I also have to recognize that I work in quite a special place mm -hmm. uh, whereby we have a lot of incredibly capable people and we're but at the same time we are doing a lot of very extreme stuff um i think in in the in the, uh, uh, but i think we're actually we're actually quite well supported by the institution and also by each other uh, most of the time i mean it's not always the case but most of the time um now i think that if that doesn't exist uh for people who are working in less resource, well resourced places or places that are uh, more demanding, who are trying to get more out of people in a different way, I think that there could be very bad problems actually. Um, so uh, I think that um, a lot of attention needs to be put, put there. And you're talking structural tensions, sort of the, 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 the dynamics within, within various different uh, uh, trusts or organizations yeah I think so I think that there are th th there are people who sort of fall in between for example so you have people who may be contract workers in a hospital who are not part of the healthcare system but are part of the support staff and uh, I, I mean I see these people all, all, all around myself I see them in all different hospitals um, and I wonder do they get the support that I have? Uh, the the taxi drivers who bring patients to and from the hospitals, right. do they yeah. have the support? Uh, the what's it like being a policeman and an ambulance driver, uh, or an amb or, or or somebody working in the ambulance services uh, in the time of COVID or, or 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 wars when you're exposing yourself in in such an unknown way. Mm -hmm. uh, I do hope that we we give people plenty of support. Um, I'm going to have to give you over to to our audience in a few minutes, but just one. What, I mean, I'll still be involved, even with other people asking questions. But one one thing I'm curious about is, I mean, UOK Doc was set up to normalise, uh, to educate, inform, be able to discuss emotional, mental well-being. And, emotional mental health. Um, do, do you have your own ideas about how to progress that within the culture of medicine? Um, well, I, I think that what I'm saying is not going to be new, but I think that uh, it is important for uh, people, all people, including people who might be considered as leaders, to be open about it, to recognize it happens, and to be very supportive of it. Uh, I, that I think will be just as important as structured uh, mm -hmm. well being sessions. Um, I think that what you're doing is actually immensely useful. Uh, you're reaching a, a very wide audience in what you're doing, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, those are my views at the moment. No, it's a very important. I think, and it's very, it's very useful to hear that it doesn't. I mean, as well as sort of, sort of structured sessions or opportunities to talk to somebody, just the culture uh, in general of being able to talk about these things. I mean, I'm a great advocate of just normalising things to be to be able to talk about the difficult challenges without feeling that you're either going to be judged or criticized or, or in some ways seen as, as weak. Um, I mean, you have a very, what, what's that saying that you told me? There's, there's always, things will always get better. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. So I, I, I my, my view is that, uh, uh, is, is, is simply that what, you know, if you're having a bad day, it's going to get better. Um, and may, maybe this is a self-defense mechanism. Uh, it probably is in part, but I, I've found that, and we work with all sorts of people in, in medicine. Uh, I found that sometimes uh, interactions between people, between professionals, 
between colleagues, between healthcare workers is not always as good as it could be. Now, if you're actually well-intentioned and you've got a goal in mind, uh, I, I've been sort of, as it were, resilient enough to think that if things are not going so well and I've done my best, then probably the other person's having a bad day uh, and they need a bit of support and it, it's going to get better. Um, I also have a sort of general view that a, a medical career is a bit like uh, being on a boat heading for a destination. And sometimes you have rough seas and bad winds, and sometimes you have fair weather and everything's going very smoothly. But the important thing is to keep going and to have enough reserve in the tank to get through the more difficult days uh, and enjoy the. Uh, the better days. Um, I'm going to give way to Dan now because I'm sure he's got several questions that he's wanting to uh, put into the mix. Yeah, I do. I've got, um, I've got quite a few questions. So uh, one, Mr. Kunar, um, is Dan. You can call me Armin if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I know you find that difficult. Maybe in fifty. <laughs> um, I'm putting you on the spot now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is um, it surrounds leadership. So um, what is the secret behind um, being a successful senior consultant and a father of six? Uh, were there sacrifices you had to make in either your personal or career life to juggle them? Okay, uh, big question. Okay. Uh, the, uh, let, if I can take the sacrifices one first. I think the far bigger sacrifice was made by my wife and my kids not me uh and i i i owe so much to them uh the the, the kids are now uh, 24 to 10 and i think that being very honest about it i think the two elders three elders but in particular two elders they, they hardly saw me and they have a, a we have a different relationship i think uh as compared to the younger ones who see me with more time uh, working sometimes from home, uh, a, a home, one home that they've pretty much known for all their lives. Whereas when I was training, um, uh, we didn't have to, but we moved quite a lot because we had a growing family. And also, uh, we sort of enjoyed doing up houses as well, to be honest. Um, so they moved a lot. Uh, and, uh, that, that's where the sacrifice is. Uh, for, for me, I uh, feel that I uh, missed out a lot of time with my parents and wider family and friends, actually. Uh, my life since my mid-twenties has pretty much been work or family. Um, so that's where the uh, uh, sacrifice goes and then the, the other part of your question Dan uh, I think was uh, I mean it may, maybe you could just articulate it again but but leadership as a can you just say it again please it was um, what is the secret behind being a successful senior consultant well um, I think I'm reasonably successful uh, I I uh, for, for me, at this point, it's to try to make sure that my team is really well functioning. And uh, I uh, think it's, it, it's important to be nice to people uh, and uh, not, not to get them to do things, but just it's nice to have uh, uh, w warm, friendly relations with people. I think people do better mm -hmm. like that. Um, I, the other aspect, I think, is being well organized, uh, do, trying not to do things at the last minute, which imposes a pressure uh, on you, which is uh, desirable to avoid. So I think that to sum it up, I think try to do things that actually reduce your pressure, be organized, do things in advance, um, and having an idea about what you're trying to achieve. I think those are important characteristics. 
Um, and uh, there's a question regarding debriefing uh, uh, with doctors. Do you feel debriefing uh, is, is executed well enough within a hospital setting? Um, in, in all honesty, I don't. Uh, uh, I don't think that formal debriefing is, is, is done well overall, but I think there are exceptional things that uh, are done. Uh, and I think, uh, I, I, I think that one of the most useful things is actually informal debriefing. And that's actually gathering your team together afterwards and just uh, spending a bit of time saying, what did we do well, what, what did we not do well, rather than something that is more structured. Um, currently, at the moment, we are uh, having a process of, of almost sort of, you know, daily electronic debriefs, uh, whereby there's a circular s sent out, fairly short, uh, of news of what's happened in the hospital as an update. Now, of course, you have to read that to engage with it. But I have this sense that actually the, the hospital is trying to debrief and be interested and be engaged with people. But I think we could probably do better. I mean, you're sort of talking about both um, sort of formal and informal, if I understand. It's a sort of mix, holding yeah. the two together, really. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, you, you, can, you can have a formal debrief. So, for example, at the end of an operation, you can say what went well, what didn't go well. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you can uh, sort of learn from that and you can undertake a sort of tick box exercise of, of, of things. But actually, I think what's more important is actually the, uh, it's, it's the kind of recognition that a, a team did something together because mm -hmm. next time they'll do it better together. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that teams are terribly important. And I, I think that uh, systems that don't encourage teams will break down. Uh, because there's a lot of shared learning, culture, and trust within a team. I mean, I'm sure there are, there are people listening who don't, I mean, uh, um, you're, the sense is you're quite an inspirational leader in the way that you're talking. Um, that, that just comes across very clearly in your certainty and confidence and belief in, in what you're saying, which I can imagine goes a long way towards uh, making people feel secure, safe, and able to talk about things. When people in situations where they're not uh, with, with a leader such as yourself, do, do you have any advice or suggestions to them as to uh, if, if they're struggling, the sort of things that they may be able to or need to sort of attend to? Okay, um, well, the, the best way I can answer that is think about when I've been in those circumstances myself. And uh, I, I have worked with people who have been very difficult, undermining, uh, bordering on or, or, or definitely in some kind of personality disorder. Mm. And I have... Uh, and, 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 and part of it is bullying. Part of it is a power thing because you know, that, becomes, that becomes a problem if they've got control over you. Mm. So uh, I think the f one, an important thing to do is to realize and to recognize where the problem lies. And if you are well-intentioned doing what you can do, remember, we're all human beings. We, we're not superhuman. None of us are superhuman. So if you're being asked to do something that's not beyond your capacity and you can't do it, you can't, there's no point trying to kill yourself to do it. There really isn't. I mean, you, you will have better results by walking away from the issue, having some rest, distancing yourself from the problem and being able to look at it in a more objective way. Mm -hmm. So when I've been in that situation, first of all, I've recognized that issue then I've talked to other people about it. I've and got some understanding about it. I have then asked myself, is this something that I can change or is it something that I cannot change? 
And if, if I can change it, I will endeavor to change it. And if I can't change it, I'll just work out a survival strategy, actually. And that can be some variation of being, being able to grin and bear it. Now, I realize that I may be able to do that, but somebody else might not be able to do that. I'm six foot five, you know, I, depending on how fit I am, I weigh between 110 and 120 kilos. But other people are not in that situation, I realize. Um, and I'm a, a man and, you know, there are gender issues. We know about it. It's been very well discussed in, uh, in, in a lot of contemporary conversations. Um, so uh, try to survive it. But at the same time, don't allow it to bring you down. If it's bringing you down, you need to remove yourself from that situation because it will bring you down too much and you'll lose your energy and you need your energy to do things well. How, 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 what are the sort of ways in which um, one can remove themselves from those those um, situations? So, uh, again, I'll, I'll talk about my own experience, uh, if I may. Um, but, but the, you know, the, the sort of the standard answer to that would be uh, within, because we're talking to doctors, if you're in a trust, go to your surgical tutor, your medical tutor, go to somebody who you think is safe, go to your HR, um, document it, uh, talk to your friends about it, talk to your family about it, get a, get a big hug, okay? Build yourself back up as a human being. Uh, on a personal level, um, it, it, it's happened to me when I was a senior house officer. It's happened to me when I was a registrar. And you might think these things don't stop, but it's happened to me as a consultant. And uh, as a consultant, I have been put into a situation cornered and put into a very difficult situation uh, without wishing to identify anybody, I was about to undertake a major operation and I was verbally assaulted uh, in a very underhand and, and ill-mannered way. And at that point, I was absolutely incandescent and furious, but uh, I, I was... I was brought up I, I am uh, I, I'm able to control it uh, sang froid, you know keep cool and um, but although I didn't respond although part of me wanted to you know lash out uh, I I had a, a physiological uh, response to this a fight or flight response but I couldn't fight because I'd have probably killed what whoever uh, and I couldn't uh, run away because I had a patient under general anaesthetic. And I actually had to remove myself from the situation. I had to um, uh, allow the physiological response to go. I actually had to call in a couple of uh, colleagues, very senior colleagues, to actually talk it through. And it took about an hour before I was actually able to operate. Uh, and uh, it took me probably about six months to a year before I was able to have any sort of real communication with the provocateur. Uh, and, you know, I discussed it afterwards and all sorts of things. The, uh, half the hospital wanted me to make a big issue about it. Uh, actually, my wife said to me, you know what, they're probably just having a really bad day. And that was, that helped me a lot. Did the fight or flight? Did, so in that did that hour, that that period was a way of of what sort of moving away from the fight or flight. Yeah, it did. Uh, so uh, it, it, I think most of us have been in some situation where w whether it's an accident or uh, a very threatening situation whereby y y you have a tachycardia a high heart rate you're a bit tremulous you're not thinking in the same way mm. um it, it very briefly 
such a circumstance can occur during an operation, to, uh, in my experience. It's, it's usually mm. very transient, and it'll happen when something unexpected will happen. And uh, I, I control that by anticipation. If I know we're about to be in a difficult situation, I'll be, you know, I'll let the team know this is a risky situation. We're all, we're all calm. But if it happens unexpectedly, you can have a, a, a surge. And at that point, what I'll do is I'll uh, just do some deep breathing during an operation and it'll pass within a few seconds. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think all surgeons have those strategies. Uh, sometimes, very rarely, you'll get a shake and you, you need to know how to control that. Um, but in, in that situation, what I, it, was, it was actually quite a prolonged attack and I, there, I had no way of being able to release all the physiological stress hormones. So I had to let them calm down and I had to let it fade away. And there was a combination of talking to some people, a bit of deep breathing, a little bit of walking just outside the operating theater area, getting a little bit of fresh air. And then it calmed down. Uh, but I think at that point it was really important because first of all, I wasn't uh, clear about my own capacity to actually perform the operation to the standard I would have wanted and expected of myself and the patient deserved. But I was also at that point, just, I thought my, my judgment might, might not be right. I might not actually, where I might under other circumstances choose to tie, I might choose to cut. And so I wanted to be in the best frame of mind uh, because that's what a, an elective operation deserves. Had you instinctively learned th those things that you've just described as a, as a means to bring your centre yourself again, to focus? Or, or are some of these things taught? Um, it, it, it's, it's a bit of both, I think. Uh, I, it's interesting you say that. From a, from a very early age, even as a child, I uh, felt that I was able to, I mean, I wouldn't get flustered when other people would get flustered. Um, I, uh, I had a great teacher who uh, used to uh, tell us uh, to keep cool, sang froid, uh, when we faced uh, stressful situations, you know, keep, keep a cool head uh, and you can do better in those situations. Um, Did anybody ask how? Uh, well, so not not at the time, uh, but later on, people have asked me how, and uh, it, it it actually took a while before I realised other people didn't do it automatically. So uh, I, uh, uh, I, I very simple things, just sort of uh, just mentally standing back from a situation and taking mm. a big breath in, actually. Mm. Um, uh, and and other uh, and other things, uh, which uh, I don't think you've got enough time for. Uh, well, let's go to another question so we can get okay. in as possible. Yeah, so we've got um, a question regarding pressure around uh, you as a surgeon. Um, have you always been able to manage this pressure, or did you learn along the way? And if if the latter, what is your advice for those starting out as a surgeon? Well, okay. that's, that's a continuation of the question we were just, yeah. so we're back in. Yeah, okay. So um, uh, I think that you, I think that one has a, a natural disposition. You need to, and one needs to build on that, actually. So uh, I think that in surgery, because that's where the question lies, whatever it is that stresses you, do more of it or don't do it at all so if uh if if it's too stressful and everybody's different uh you're probably best not doing it you won't have a good time your your sir your patient won't have a good time if it's something that you think is within your capacity and you want to be good at it do it so it becomes automatic uh, so you can do that anastomosis with your eyes closed, with your hand tied behind your back. Uh, if you can't use both hands to tie knots, train yourself to, to uh, 
be able to use both hands. And it's very simple. You take a piece of string and you put your favorite movie on and you practice till you can watch your favorite movie without looking at your hands. What, what's your favorite movie? I have a number of favorite movies. <laughs> my, my eldest son would say that Independence Day is my favorite movie. Uh, uh, Independence Day 1. Uh, because I, uh, I watched it about 15 times while he was in gestation. So uh, I don't know why. It, it just captured my imagination. But I like lots of other movies. Well, it's a bit, if, I, if I remember, it's, it's overcoming extraordinary uh, 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 challenges, isn't it? Yeah, but I could also tell you that Betty Blue is one of my favorite movies. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Dan, we've got a, another one? Yeah, we do. Uh, we have a question um, regarding the training uh, program. So Adam Kay said he thought that America had it right in terms of medicine being a postgraduate course. Uh, given your thoughts uh, on needing other experiences, do you think this is something the UK should consider? Um, personally, I don't think so. Uh, I think that uh, we should, uh, I think that medicine is a lifelong journey. And the going to medical school, passing your medical exams to come out of medical school, and passing postgraduate exams are just flags along the way that mark your learning. Uh, I think that medical school is way too long. Uh, I think that the core knowledge within medical school can be taught far faster. I think that people should get a wide range of life experiences, which they should, um, which they should try to get from all sorts of things. And I'll say it here, and uh, I wonder if somebody from the GMC is listening, but I think the main reason why medical school in the UK is currently five or six years is to make money for universities. Uh, and I think that you can learn everything you need to know to come out to the standard of a current medical graduate in about three years, maybe three and a half. Uh, we are not delivering babies when we come out of hospital, uh, out of medical school. We're not setting fractures. We're not suturing up big wounds. We're not independent. We're still mentored for many years and we work in teams. That's the short answer. Do, do, do you think 1819 is too young? No. You no, not at, not at all. I mean, you know, is, 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 is 60 too old to be a consultant? No, it's a journey. It's a journey. You've got to enjoy the journey. Uh, a, uh, somebody going into medical school, uh, somebody coming out of medical school. Uh, uh, yes, they've got more life experience, but you learn through what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the... Uh, uh, you acquire experiences in different ways. Uh, I personally, uh, to be honest, I think that it's almost patronizing to say to uh, somebody that you have to, to go and do another degree beforehand. Uh, I, I, it's, I, it, it's, it, it's almost, uh, it's almost making it an exclusive privilege of, of the rich to go to medical school. I'm very anti that. Mm -hmm. Just to, just to pick up on what you were saying earlier, because I just remembered, a face sort of either confronting the things that stress you or, or removing yourself from the stresses. Is that, is that how you put it? Yeah, I think that's one way of, of, of putting it. Are you meaning that to, to really face the fears that, that, that come from that stress and anxiety and, and begin to reduce them? begin to learn to accommodate them. And um, if you can't, then you, you move away from it. So I think that with regard to surgical performance, and it probably it's applicable more widely, is that you, you, you have to do really well all the time. If you, you can't do kind of okay in surgery, it doesn't work. Um, so you have to be really good at it. If you're really good at it, you'll feel good about it. You'll feel confident in what you're doing mm. and you will perform to a high level. You'll be able to go into the zone and lose yourself in the operation. It'll be very satisfying. The patient will have a great outcome. If you can't get to that point, it's better to be honest and it's better to 
move to some area that you can do it. Within medicine, there's all sorts of people doing all sorts of things. Um, mm. To my mind, being a pediatric cardiac surgeon working on neonates is one of the highest, most technically demanding things you can do. Mm. And it's, it is more technically demanding than sewing together big vessels, which is what I might do. So technically, the pediatric cardiac surgeon is performing at a different level of dexterity to what I am performing. And the, we're fortunate in the UK that we have very tight training and very tri tight regulation. So pediatric cardiac surgeons, I think they love what they do because they're very good at it. But not everybody can be a pediatric cardiac surgeon. So that's what I mean to either do it very well or don't do it because it, yes. will, it will be unsatisfying and will not be good for patients. Yeah. Um, we, we've got, I think we've got five, six minutes left to squeeze some other questions in there. Uh, yeah, so this one's, um, I think, referencing when you say in the zone when you're doing surgery in the QR. So uh, when you say you are in the zone, is that similar to being in a state of uh, mindfulness. Yes, I think so. I, but I'm not really sure what mindfulness is. Um, whether uh, so, I, I I believe mindfulness is about just being in the moment and being aware of the moment. I think that's what most people think of it. So you're not being distracted by your phone. For me, being in the zone is one step above that. So I am oblivious to anything other than the task in hand. So maybe some people will say that's mindfulness. Maybe people will say that it's, it, it's in a different level. So I'm not aware of the passage of time, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, you're, immer you're in the zone, aren't you? You're focused, you're what one could call it a meditative or mindful practice. But... Well, you know, I'm glad you said that meditative and it wasn't, I, I didn't actually sort of want to go there because uh, it, it, people might think it's a bit too esoteric or exotic, but I think it is that. I think it's, it's very meditative. Mm -hmm. And you asked me a question earlier on and in, in the course of this conversation, I was, uh, I, I, perhaps I wasn't earlier on, I wasn't ready to go there. But I think that from an early time, I was able to go into the zone, which I now uh, am fortunate enough to be able to go into when I'm operating. Do you think people can, I mean, my guess is it's come in its own way quite naturally to you. Do you think you can cultivate it, learn it? Um, I think that many of the uh, of the things that help can be learnt. Yeah, I do, very much so. I think that uh, being, for example, I think that most people can re find ex elements in their life where they have felt very relaxed uh, and free. And to be able to recall that moment and some imagery that goes with it. So for me, it's mountains or a particular beach mm -hmm. in Norfolk, uh, not the Caribbean, but Norfolk. Um, and uh, uh, I think that you can uh, train yourself to induce those feelings of well being with tricks such as the imagery. Does that help? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, it did. Sorry, I thought, I thought I'd lost contact with you there for a no, second. No, no, I, I was just in the zone. <laughs> you were in the zone. <laughs> uh, let's try and squeeze one more question in, Dan, if we can, before we unfortunately have to finish. Uh, yes. So, um, how do you transition from the high intense days uh, you have to your family life at home? Well, <laughs> in this day and age, I come in, I take my coat off and wash my hands. Um, but uh, the, uh, so I, I, I think 
I think I think you, it's it's a good question. I think I'm quite good at it, Dan. Uh, I think that I uh, switch off pretty quickly. Uh, but uh, there are times when I haven't been. So I, in, in a practical sense, I would say if you're not on call, put your phone away. Um, don't log on to your work email. In fact, in this day and age, we spend so much time with devices in the daytime. I'd actually say avoid the devices, despite me talking to you guys now. Uh, I'd say try and put in some physical activity, spend some time with the kids, uh, lose yourself in what they're doing. Um, uh, smell some flowers, take some time to, to do that. That's what, I, that's what I would say to do. And, you know, if you're lucky enough to, uh, to be able to fit in a bit of sport in the evening, uh, uh, do that as well, uh, because it's, it, 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 it's great. Um, I'm not a big enthusiast for alcohol. I've, I, I'm, I'm a hopeless drinker. Um, but I know people find that helpful. Um, I, I can't tell you whether that's a good thing to do or not. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, nature and family and uh, a hug is is probably better. I mean, you're you're reminding me of the, our first speaker was Caroline Wen, who um, was speaking very much about all those things that you've just mentioned. Um, just all the um, evidence supports. Uh, all those different things uh, help contribute to emotional mental well-being and moving yourself from those environments that you and uh, doctors medical practitioners are in back into another space where uh, it's so important to reconnect to yourself in a different sort of way um, so it's very interesting that you're articulating these things um, and they're just very clearly there in all the books about how to attend to your own mental, emotional well-being. Dan, can we, um, I don't know if we've got one more question, but I'd say I'd like to bring you actively in to be able to say your thank yous. Hi, Mr. Kino. Hi, Dan. Dan, <laughs> you've done your hair since I last saw you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for mentioning that. <laughs> uh, no, thank you, Mr. Kino. It's been really... Um, uh, you can call me Armin, by the way. Later. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's been fantastic having you on. Um, and it's been really insightful as well, especially having, I think we've had various speakers, haven't we, Chris, uh, that have come on and, 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 and spoken. And uh, we actually haven't had a consultant, so you're our first consultant um, that has come and spoken, I think, really openly as well. Uh, so thank you for that. Well, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I... Uh, as I, as I said to you, I, I hadn't really had the opportunity to look through any of your of the previous speakers, and I caught uh, about three minutes of uh, one of them. And uh, I, even in th those three minutes, I, I realized that uh, their words were similar to, to mine. So maybe there are some common themes, uh, and uh, we're all expressing them differently. Uh, so... I think that's absolutely right. I think one of the things that sort of come, come clear to me over the, the six uh, program series, everybody is essentially saying the same thing in their own way um, about how to attend to your mental, emotional well-being. It's, it's really interesting, fascinating to hear what it feels like very intuitive ways you've brought uh, ways to sort of attend to your own mental, emotional well-being and also being focused in your work. I mean, it's a, it's a lovely sort of conclusion ending to the to this series of speakers to, to listen to literally what it's like to be on the front line in such a specialist area. So thank you very much. Thank you again. May I say one thing, which you, you in response to what you just said, I, I don't want anybody to think that it's always easy. It isn't at all. And we've spoken about uh, mental uh, yeah. health. Uh, I think that in the, all of this process, I think at times I have uh, gone too far over the other end. I, I, at times I have uh, lost that energy, but I've recognized that and brought it back. Mm -hmm. um, 
and also uh, at, at, at the most extreme times of not looking after myself, I think my physical health has suffered. But again, I've been able to bring that back. So uh, we're all human. And I think that uh, I'm lucky enough to have that learning now after this many years. And I hope that in the important thing that you're doing, other people will be able to learn that faster than me. Thank you very much. And uh, good luck with the dogs. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's Thank lots of cooking going on in the background yeah. as well. Enjoy. Thank you very much. For being Thank you very us. much. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.